Welcome to Holistically Speaking. I'm Hilary Russo, Certified Holistic Health Coach and Health and Wellness Journalist. This is an empowering place to explore self-awareness, self-love, and transformation through health, healing, and humor. By sharing life-changing experiences, knowledge, and guests with varied expertise, we'll explore who we are, how we got that way, and what it takes to be a happy and healthy grown-up. Mind, body, and spirit. I'm glad you're here. When I think of the word family, a few thoughts come to mind. Maybe you'll agree. For starters, I think of words like tradition, storytelling, safety, community, values, and of course, love. But sometimes the stories of our ancestry are not so positive. And then the words may change. Susan Greif knows this all too well. As a daughter of Holocaust survivors, she gets it. And her work as a creative transformational coach goes right to the heart. Artfully, actually. Ancestral trauma runs deep in the subconscious mind. It can leave you feeling powerless, paralyzed, and in pain if you don't have the right tools or guidance. The truth is, what's intergenerational means it didn't start with you. So why do we behave the way we do? And where do we go from here? That's where Susan steps in with her creative coaching. She helps her clients heal the relationships with themselves and build better ones with the branches of their family trees. Art heals, or in her case, art mends hearts. Right to the roots, my friends. That's where we're going on this week's Holistically Speaking. I really want to welcome you to the podcast. It's such a pleasure to finally have a chance to just sit down and have a conversation with you, Susan. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. So I, you know, you and I met, and I would say met because we haven't we haven't really met yet. We met virtually through a group online through a mutual friend, um, the Gate Group, which is really a powerful group. And um, what I'm finding is we're we're really we're all walks of life in groups like that. And I think human connection is really bringing a lot of people together and really we're getting a chance to see just how powerful we can all be together and bring our strengths to the world. And for you, learning about you a little bit has been really empowering, uh, focusing on the ancestral trauma, focusing on being a creative trans transformational expert, using your own story from how to heal. I, I would love for that to be um, something we, we touch on now as well. You know, you're the daughter, second generation of Holocaust survivors. And um, that in itself is, uh, is really paving the way for a story right there. Yeah. So first, uh, yes, uh, I think heart is definitely something I'm very involved with. It's all about, uh, I'm very heart centered. And with that, the heart chakra is about giving and receiving. And mm. as women, we have a hard time doing that, right? Giving and receiving and finding the balance in that. So that's the transformation. You know, I have to help with my clients to find the place to give and receive. And, and also being a child of Holocaust survivors, there is the whole nature and nurture component of being an intergenerational post-traumatic stress. That's what we tend to have, the ancestral mm -hmm. trauma. And it's not just our own trauma. It's the trauma of our parents. It's the trauma of how their environment kind of change their DNA in a way and it was you know and then passed on to the next generation and how they raised us the fears that they had their their hyper awareness hyper anxiety we became hyper vigilant because of them we became the survivors because of them and as children of survivors there are, there are traumas and there's two ways most people will react to their parents either they would you know do everything their parents tell them to do because they feel guilty that their parents went through the war mm -hmm. or there are children who, whose parents are so angry and abusive because of the war, because of what they went through and they needed to separate themselves. So they rebelled. Mm -hmm. So you have to find the balance of there in itself. You know, if you're a child who did everything for your parents, you never did it for yourself. 
Yeah, you know, if your child who rebelled, I mean, there wasn't that nurturing, caring. They were given. They were only mm. for themselves. Was there always a desire to want to work on your own transformation and your own healing, knowing that you were coming from a background where your parents dealt with such atrocities? And was there a point in your life where you you noticed I, I need to I need to make a change so I'm living powerfully? And I'm able to uh, put like trickle that down to my children. Uh, where was where was that in your life? Well, I was I was the child who listened to her parents, and mm. you know, because my parents were very loving, and I was very fortunate to have parents like my parents. But so then, every, you, you just listened, and you did everything they told you to do, and you're in that can't make a decision for yourself mode because you need to please them, you know? And, mm. and, and then or, earlier on, my marriage was similar, you know, I, mm. I, you know, we tend to repeat our relationships over and over again. So I found I was doing the same thing, you know, for my husband just wanting to please him. And he, I kind of got lost. And every time I wanted to go for myself, do what I, my passion tells me, that there was a reason why I couldn't. Um, mm-hmm. I had written a chapter called Crossing Bridges in an anthology called Life Spark, uh, Inspire, Ignite, Illuminate. And um, and it, it's about like not the fear of crossing your bridges. And uh, and I related to the old folktale, Billy Goat Gruff, Three Billy Goat mm-hmm. Gruff. And yeah. the three Billy Go- Goats get to the bridge and like they want to go to a you know, greener pasture. And, um, but there's that troll underneath the bridge that won't allow them to go. And all three goats figure out how to get to those sides. Like they were not going to let this troll or I call negative self-talk or that negative person that always, you know, kept us from doing what we wanted to do. Uh, they, they, I, they would not allow that troll to stop them from crossing over. So that was about empowerment. And when I was finally able to um, go back to school and I realized this is what I want to do and go in, even though I didn't get the great support in the beginning, like, Oh, this is amazing. It's amazing. I got the support. Like, honey, if you're happy. Great. But it wasn't like, you know, my husband is very logical, you know, so mm-hmm. it's for him. He doesn't, he doesn't understand it. And I'm okay with that. We, we come mm-hmm. to an agreement that we're, we, we both are happy with what we do and we just support each other for that. So, but once I was able to get there, that's when I learned how to be empowered. And, and that's when I actually met a group of amazing uh, women on Facebook pages of Daughters of Holocaust Survivors. And mm-hmm. at that point, I was relating to them. I offered them because I found so much emotion was going on there. I, uh, and I offered a free workshop that's for the first time with these women and did, you know, through a drawing. And through them, I decided to realize, like, wow, I, I do, have, you know, I do have my own issues. I knew there was a commitment issue because, you know, the parents told you what to do. Yeah, you know? I and and also the whole idea of the Holocaust, where you know we don't set roots, like we always have to be on the run. Mm-hmm. So that was the thought. A lot of people are afraid to commit. They need to be on the run. They don't want to ever be stuck anywhere and not leave. And that was yeah, Holocaust created. And- part of the healing truly is realizing how much we are rooted, you know, getting to the root work of things. So it's interesting that you bring that up. It's like that constant on the run. There's never any settled feeling within your heart, within your mind. And we need to feel rooted to something. We need rooted and we need to feel grounded, you know. And and the root chakra, we know, is, is about your ancestral beliefs and thoughts and traditions and and whatever it is they told you and it creates, you know, a safe place for, you know, anxiety or not, you know, so that's all root chakra, which yeah. is that being grounded. I love how you bring in your background uh, from, from all of your learnings that you've gotten involved with from the yoga and the art and cr- just the creative mind. Uh, you're able to embody that and bring that all into the work you're doing with others. And I find that always fascinating when I talk to people because maybe because I've been on a similar journey, you know, going through my own traumas and going through my own healing and bringing a sense of me, which makes me different from you, which makes you different from uh, somebody else. And we, we all have such a beautiful gift to give 
it, when we go through the healing because we're so unique, you know? And right. so from everything you've created in your life, the dance, the art, the creative side of Susan and embodying that with the woman who went through the trauma and the ancestral trauma and just your own coming to be, there are people out there that will gravitate to that and see the the beauty behind working with you. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, we have some, you know, I hope so because I think, you know, when you do work with me and it's because I'm very different, I have my, you know, my unique um, multi, you know, multidisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. People are, you know, a little weary about this, you know, not sure, like I don't understand it, but once you sit with me that first session, it's like, there's always a major aha moment. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you have to be willing to be open on a consultation to go there. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, I, and I get that too, because as someone who's uh, a Havening Techniques practitioner, a lot of people don't know what that specifically is. If they're not aware of the the actual process of the the neuroscience and just how it can alter your thoughts, moods, and behavior, and just change the way you think about things um, in the most beautiful, holistic way. So many folks out there are still on that whole traditional therapy route, whereas there are so there's so much there's such a benefit that comes from the um, complementary alternative medicines, you know. And yeah, we can, absolutely. Yeah, so it's really letting people have the gift of just understanding it first, and then just take a moment and see what this can bring to you and it's going to gravitate some people are going to gravitate to something that's art related the, the creating the artwork like you do someone's going to be more into the psychosensory approach which i do and there's no right or wrong it's just what's right for you so exactly. bringing them bringing them the gift and letting them make the choice because we always we always have a choice that's the thing I choose to choose affirmations, one of my favorites, you know? Yes, yes, yes. I yeah. choose happiness is another one. <laughs> yeah, totally. But we have to make a choice first, right? Right. So with with the ancestral trauma, uh, you know, this is this is an interesting time too, because here we are just as Jewish women, uh, we're, we're embarking on the most holiest of holidays coming up in September. And how does one how do you approach your clients or how does one deal with being around the table with this, this is and being in a, an environment where there could be a lot of people who have gone through trauma. Uh, unfortunately, where the, the amount of Holocaust survivors still that, it, that are left on this planet are, are becoming fewer and fewer, but how does one Deal with that effectively in the most positive way and realize you're rejoicing just being with people who are part of your lineage. You know, I think first we have to always remember it's it's a new year and it's all about um, traditions again, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether you observe or you don't observe the new year. Mm -hmm. um, and it can also, we can also bring this up to like, you know, for Christmas time, it's the same idea, like, you know, using the holidays, uh, um, religious holidays in order to bring the family together. And mm -hmm. how do you sit at the table with these people that like, you know, with different opinions, different values, different morals and so forth. Um, and, you know, the truth is, it's really not worth your energy to argue with somebody who is not willing to change. I think mm -hmm. that you have to understand because some people have their, you know, have their opinions and if you persuade them, great. If not, you're not going to change them. And they have to look inside themselves and realize, you know, this is their opinions. Mm -hmm. Also, um, you know, we tend to react like we were when we were kids to similar situations and we never let go of that situation. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing we can do is understand, become aware of what triggers us. Mm -hmm. And instead of reacting, take that moment to pause, walk away from, if you have to, take those three deep breaths and come back with a smile because really you're not changing anybody at that point and you're just going to build up anger and negative energy. And you don't want to bring negative energy to a dinner table because at the end, like you're angry and that person has no idea. What's, what's that Buddhist saying? Um, that 
like you have ang- your anger is like holding a coal, you know, burn coal because only you get hurt. So mm. about letting go. Yeah, and I think it definitely comes back to the empathy too, and and practicing resonance, which I always I always love going to because it is a practice to realize like what is it like to be that person. We don't know the battle that that person's going through, and I think we all have people in our family that were like, oh gosh, are they coming to the dinner this year? <laughs> Please exactly. say no. You know, it's exactly. no matter what your faith is, or even if you don't practice a faith, um, right? You know, whatever, whatever you are embodying around your. Faith, family especially uh, it's giving, it, let's just say you know it doesn't yeah, really matter and there's always going to be someone that says something that you're you just you you're you're feeling like the top is about to blow but i i couldn't agree with you more step back take some breaths you know there's different approaches to how to to change your thoughts and your moods and and how you behave and your reactions especially because sometimes those people that are doing that could also be very well aware of what they're doing. There's the narcissistic tendencies. There's the passive aggressiveness. It's their own upset right. and anger and has exactly. nothing to do with you. Exactly. We always use that mirroring approach. You know, people mm-hmm. mirror, you know, mirror what's inside them, you know, with, mm-hmm. and it has nothing to do with you. I remember watching uh, a video that you had online and you were holding up the mirror and I'm like, yup, mirroring. That's it, mirroring. <laughs> I wish more people stuff. would do it. <laughs> Not mine. That's I tell my clients, like, you know, if somebody approaches them and like, you don't know where it comes from. Remember, don't absorb it. Like put the mirror up. It's a reflection of them. Nothing to do with you. Yeah. They can't yeah. control you. They can't control your thought. They can't control your actions. That would frustrate them and has nothing to do with you. And we're giving them the power by allowing ourselves to get upset. It's not that we we can't be we can't um, be aware of what's happening, but how we react to it is is our choice. You know, exactly, exactly. And that's and I, why I say, like that's where the somatic comes in. Like when you feel it, like know your body mind connection. Feel your body. Know when you start to tense up. Know how you, when you're about to you know have a, a fit. I'm like. Take, once you feel it in your body, take those deep breaths because your breath is going to slow down the tensity that, that comes within your body, the muscles, you know, the, the anger, the, you know, the heart beating fast, you know, the whole, everything that is, you know, uh, the entire system, you know, nervous system. You know. Absolutely. Slow down those waves in the brain too, you know, just exactly. bring the brain waves Focus. slower, the delta waves, and then they, you'll be much happier in doing so. So Absolutely. with with your work in uh, creative transformation and even with the uh, ancestral trauma, and I know you work with couples as well, mm-hmm. where does the artwork come into play? So, you know, where does that creative art that you're putting in front of them to uh, to create, where does that come into play? So, you know, I'm, I have to say I'm not an art therapist, so mm-hmm. I don't do the work that most art therapists do. What I do is I have them do simple drawings and I've worked with two and three year olds. So it doesn't really matter what, Mm -hmm. how they draw. It's not about the drawing. It's about the process. Mm -hmm. So I give them a prompt after what we've been talking about. They do a drawing simple and, you know, no experience needed, no, no talent needed. And they do a drawing. And during that time, it's, kind of like doing an active meditation because mm. you're in the zone you're you're just you're just producing and as you're producing your drawing memories come up thoughts come up you know beliefs come up or emotions come up and from that they have to write about it then after they write about it so now they they visualize it because now they took their thoughts and their beliefs and emotions and they put it on in their drawing subconsciously and then they review it and they look at it and they write about it. Then I take their drawing and I interpret them and Mm -hmm. I will find something in the drawings that have me question things. You know, Mm -hmm. why is it, let's say, why is there, you know, a line across this person's throat? You know, why is there body parts missing? Why is this person in the family, not here. You know, all these questions that come up, like, why is it this color? Why is it this stroke? Why is there, you know, why is there, like, boundaries or whatever? There's always something going on in the drawing. I look for it. I analyze it. And then I continue to ask further questions 
from what I understand of it and what my intuition is of it. And they continue to write the answers to those questions. So now they have this full plan of, of all the conscious, all the subconscious thoughts are now on their paper. They are become aware of what's going on. They become aware of, of a pattern that they've been doing over and over again. So it's, you know, when you go to a thought, talk therapist, you can lie, you can omit, you can forget, you know, mm-hmm. and you, and you go and the following week you come back and you continue to vent because nothing's really changed. You just continue yeah. to vent. And, and a lot of talk therapists are listening and they don't help out. So I use the aspect of therapy, even though I'm not a therapist, to um, re- reflect back. And not only to reflect back, but also to make the body mind connection. And with that part of the, uh, with that part, we also move forward into coaching to, to listen to our inner wisdom, to know what the next mm-hmm. steps are. And then I help them take the strategies to make the next step. Do you prefer or do you work more with children? Um, I had started working with children and then, like I said, when I started working with adults, Holocaust survivors and their desire to work with me was greater than the desire of the child because the parent would bring the child to the sessions and we have fun and, you know, and get things across. But the problem is when I go from week to week, it's not just about showing up week to week. It's like, you mm-hmm. have homework assignments. You have to do this you know, and hold, hold yourself accountable the following week. And when you're dealing with children, you have to hold the parents accountable to make sure the kids are held accountable. And if the parent doesn't do that, it becomes more difficult to move forward. And, and then that becomes an issue. So if you have a parent that, you know, if a parent is complaining that their child is anxious, but yet the parents themselves are anxious too, they're the role model of the child. And if they're not going to change themselves and mm-hmm. be the role model that I share with them, I feel they should be and how to deal with certain situations, mm-hmm. then you can tell your kids anything and they won't listen. Then you have to be a role model. Our children learn from watching our environment, not by what we tell them to do. And what's interesting in that, that you bring that up is I've had situations with, with potential clients where I'll have people inquire about my work and uh, they'll refer somebody else like, oh, you should, you, you totally should be doing havening on my, my son, or you, you absolutely should. I would love to get you in touch with my so-and-so they, they totally could, they need this. And the problem is, and I, and this is really important for listeners. um, You can never tell somebody else what they need for healing. If anything, that goes back to the whole push pull theory, you know, that yeah. which resists persists. And if, if, but like with a parent, that's a little different. We have a responsibility to make sure our child is nurtured and well rounded and, and gets everything they need and the love and the kindness and compassion. But it still goes back to the responsibility of the parent. If you are going to make this choice to bring your child to whatever kind of therapeutic means you're using, whether it's, talk or a a complimentary alternative medicine or whatever it is, you need to be a participant in that process too, because it really is more than just the child, you know, Um, much like the homeschooling that's going on right now, you know, parents are having to take a much bigger responsibility, but you can't just expect your kid is doing the homework. And exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's about about being on top of your child without being too on top of without helicopter. Right, not exactly. being a helicopter mom. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, I had one, I had one client whose daughter in separation anxiety. So mm. her mother was a full; she was working full time, and she has three kids, and this is the older of three children. And mm. I said to the mom, I said, "You just need to give her fifteen minutes, and you will let the two little ones go to bed, and give this child fifteen minutes of your time." You know, no phone, no nothing, no distractions. Just fifteen minutes a day. That that was a that was a job. That was a homework assignment for the week, and it, it couldn't have. It was not fully accomplished. It's like really, you know, for me, I have four children, and what I did, I had a, I had my daily planner up on the wall from you know Monday to Friday with each kid's 
and, and time slots, like, mm-hmm. you know, okay, this child, you know, has a doctor's appointment, this child has a, you know, after school activity, this child has a carpool, whatever it is. And there was, and I would stick mommy time mm-hmm. for each child because it was so important for me to connect with each kid, not when the other kids are around interrupting and disrupting us. So even at bedtime, I put the first one, you know, the youngest to bed first. I read with the next child and put that child to bed. I read the next child and put the bed. And the next child put to bed also. So it's like we had that quality time alone. And it's also a moment for the parent to defrag. Get away from the the online. Get away from the texting and, and the computers and being distracted by other means. And truly give yourself the gift of the time with your child. Hear them see what yeah. they're saying, see how yeah. they're reacting, look over their, their daily, whatever they created in their room or their homework or their artwork that they're doing and, and really interact. I, I have to say, I, I, as someone who I, I myself dealt with childhood trauma, just having a dad who was in and out of the hospital um, with illness and mm-hmm. my time with him was so valuable and I would say my mom really encouraged it more than anything. Like, you know, spend time with Hillary. You need to have this time with her because you're not able to be with her on in other ways. And thank goodness for that. Like, thank goodness my right. mom made that um, that a, a thing because as yeah. someone who was working full time and ill, uh, you have to be able to not forget about the little person that needs right. the nurturing. Don't forget the little right. person, you know? Right. Or right. Just send them and to they the need to, to play with their dogs. they need to be heard too. You know, they yeah. old thing like, yo, children be seen and not heard. Really? That's really not right thing. <laughs> like they need to be heard. They need to be expressed. So even if you're, if you're, you know, one of my friends, she, she talks about like, you know, just when you, you, you think your kid needs a time out, it's really when they need a time in. Oh, know? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So she, Jen Eden, I love her. So she says that, and I, and that's been my motto. It's like, okay, you know, get down, like, you know, get down on your knees of their level and have this conversation. What is truly bothering you? You know, Mm -hmm. let them feel they're being heard. They only are, they rebel when they're don't feel heard and it's, and it's frustrating to them. So yeah, yeah. Little time in ladies and gentlemen with your, with the little ones. Absolutely. And the other thing that you mentioned before about talk therapy, which mm-hmm. there is absolutely a place for talk therapy. I, absolutely. I, I, and, and depending on who it is, because some people just don't gravitate to it. But the thing absolutely. that we've really taken seriously is that we are just re-traumatizing ourselves sometimes when we just talk, 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 go back right. every week. And all you're doing is talking, but you're not doing the work. And you're still just, stuck uh, in the back, right? Yes. In, the, in the past, you're stuck in the past. You're re-traumatizing the brain. So if the Mm -hmm. work is not done and the homework and whether it's through art or whether it's through another means of uh, another modality or just getting out and doing something to be aware of what you went through. Because if there's no awareness, there's there's no healing. Exactly. You have to be aware first, right? That's the most important step. And sometimes it's scary though because yeah. then you're opening up Pandora's box now you have to deal with it you know it's kind right. of like I I tell my clients like imagine like every time you, you walk over this rug and there's a big lump in the middle and you keep, mm-hmm. keep passing over and kicking the, the the lump and tripping and the only way to stop tripping is to lift up the carpet and know it's a heavy work so move that big boulder that's underneath it that's mm-hmm. the only way you're not going to trip anymore you got to do the hard work of lifting underneath your subconscious and doing the work and lifting that bowl and taking it out so that you can have a more calmer life. Because we tend to repeat patterns over and over and over again. Like I said, even relationships over and over again. So, yeah, I also do work with couples, but I also work with mother and, and you know, parent and child. So they can understand what the mother has gone through or the father has gone through. And I'm talking about older parents, older parents, older children mm-hmm. and their parents. Um, you know, 30 year olds and their, their mother, like understand like why their parents acted a certain way and what did they learn from that? And they don't want to repeat the next time around. You know, a lot of women who've been in an abusive relationship is because they grew up in an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, they knew and they had never been empowered. And only when you become empowered and aware of what's what's the right thing, what's not the right thing, you're going to keep repeating it over and over again. And the fact that you bring up the word child 
can be an adult child as well. Uh, you know, a lot of times when we hear that, oh, and the child and the parent, we instantly, our mindset will go to a younger, a younger person and a, a parent, but we're always the child of someone and the healing doesn't ever stop. So no. the fact that, you know, I, I think about just my own relationship getting better with my mom over the years and <clears throat> just working through some of the upsets that we might have had, the conversations I have with her now are so much more empowering because of the work I've done. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they're more powerful because of the work I've done. And the minute we decide that the kind of relationship we want is a positive one, and both parties are a part of that, it really can be a beautiful dance between those two people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I just have to, I do have to say, you know, I have lost my mom many years mm. ago. I was 29 when I lost her, and I had lost mm. my dad when I was 24. But with her and I had I had his like three little babies at that time and I had a hard time juggling, you know, my three little kids, three babies under three, you know, and and my mother's illness. And I was I was twenty nine, I was a young girl myself. And having to juggle this, uh, I actually decided to go to talk therapy. And I have to tell you, at that point in my life that was so important because mm -hmm. when my mother had was very ill, you know, there was a lot of resentment that came up during therapy, you know, while, you know, but I, and I felt like, okay, guilty, like, I can't talk about these things because she's ill. I don't want to make her sicker. Like, all of a sudden, like, my rebellion stage came through because I wasn't a rebellious child. And all I kept thinking is like, okay, don't say anything because, like, she's sick already. I can't rebel now. It's too late, you know. But I have to say, like, in her, in her later, you know, while she was getting, Sicker in the hospital. She, she unfortunately passed away of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But while we, she was in the hospital, I actually had talk with her. I actually had to needed to resolve my issues with her, mm -hmm. and I had a conversation with her. And she actually responded the way I really wanted to hear it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's you need to resolve issues and. You know, and if Uncle Joe comes to you and he's old and he's coming for the holidays and you're, you know, and you're not going to change his way, but, you know, maybe resolve your issue with them. Um, and maybe you're lucky they'll, they'll speak to you the way you wanted to hear it. But if you don't open up and say how you feel, especially saying like how you feel opposed to blaming, that's the worst thing you can do. Blame. Like, you always did this. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel you know, sad that whatever it is or angry, frustrated, and I always wanted to be close to you or whatever it is. So going back to that question, you know, maybe it's time to resolve because like you said before, you know, it'd be sad not to have that opportunity before they leave. And then you're stuck with your own issues when they leave the, the earth plane. And that's where we really go back to the childhood trauma, the inner child that we're not nurturing. I also lost my dad at a very young age. I was 29 and he had a massive heart attack. And even though he dealt with illness, the, the majority of my life, if not all of my life, um, I, I completely loved, I mean, I loved my father so much, but I realized that I was also really a warrior always worrying if he was in and out of the hospital, always worrying if he was taking his medication. Always, I mean, this this is a child thinking about, I, I have to have control of making sure my dad's okay. That wasn't my job. So when I lost my dad, there were years of, of unresolved uh, trauma that I didn't even realize I had until I really, really did the root work. And right. I realized I, I was upset because I felt like he didn't take the best care of himself or uh, as much as a loving, caring unbelievable person he was, he did have his own traumas of dealing with a disability. And right. I realized in a way that was my own control. Like, I don't want anybody to be unhealthy around me. I will do everything I can to make sure I'm healthy. And that right. is pressure I'm putting on myself, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting what comes up. So, you know, losing my parents at a young age and having kids, like, all, like, like, yeah. well, both my parents, and had four kids within an eight year time wow. Wow. <laughs> all in my all in my 20s so that was my own trauma that I was dealing with and I didn't realize at that time like when you asked me why I didn't realize that there was also the holocaust 
you know, component. Mm-hmm. It was only later on when I started working with daughters of Holocaust survivors that I realized, wow, there really is such a component. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and that's when I reflected more back on how I'm connected to the Holocaust. You know, and then I did more learning on the epigenetics, and they did study. You know, I started studying a little bit more about it and uh, and understanding. And I think that the thing I came away with and it helped me mm-hmm. and it helps my clients is to understand what our parents went through mm. to to un- to have like empathy mm-hmm. and understanding because i believe they did the best they knew how with what they knew Absolutely. and i think we need to understand yeah. once you understand that once you un- understand their upbringing their childhood what they've gone through and the traumas they have and and therefore the behavior that manifested from it and therefore we absorbed it you know, we can understand what, and then we can forgive them. And not, you know, people, a lot of my clients are angry at their parents for being abusive, but let's go back and understand why they were. Mm-hmm. And then let's feel bad for them as children, you know, and then they can forgive. Like one of my clients did that. She was so angry at her mother, you know, there's stories, but she was so angry with her mother for years and years. Finally, she got over it and she began, she made changes in her life and she ended up forgiving her mother. And then when she had a grandchild, her first grandchild, she asked the daughter to name it after her mother. So that was a complete 360 from where she was thinking about her, you know, her mother. Yeah. And the thing with that is that we don't always get a chance to resolve the issues or the upsets with the parent, especially if they've left the planet and they're not here anymore. And but that's up to us. It's our responsibility to heal ourselves, you know? Right. So if you don't have that opportunity, it doesn't mean it can't happen. You can still have peace within it, the, the person. Uh, you can have that peace by making peace with yourself and the relationship. If you're fortunate enough and the person's still here, uh, right. those conversations, if they're able to happen, they can. But then there's also the other side, Susan, that's really that do a lot of people do deal with and it's somebody who's is resistant someone who might be dealing with a mental illness someone who is not capable of of giving you back what you're hoping to get back and we are not in we should not ever be in a place where we allow the abuse to come at us you know it's our responsibility to protect ourselves from anything toxic um right. and it's it's the healthy boundaries right Healthy boundaries is very important. You know, I kind of feel like, you know, boundaries like our skin should be a bit porous. You know, mm-hmm. like like putting out all the neg, having the ability to like, you know, put up boundaries and don't let tox- you know negativity come in. You know, but also to say detox from within to get mm-hmm. rid of things that don't work for us. And uh, and I, I think you know that's what our skin does for our body. It's a boundaries for our body, so we need to create our own you know, metaphoric boundaries as well. Yeah. Cause a lot of times if we feel bad for a person too, we tend to allow the abuse to happen because we're like, well, that's just who they are. And, and no, don't do that to yourself. You, right. if, we justify. I, yeah. I mean, it's okay to walk away, but it, and, and just know that you've done your best and uh, you, you can't take on everything and heal right. other people. Nobody has the power to heal anybody else anyway, right? So True. it's it's really a question of um, what what can I add to this in the most positive way? And if it's received, wonderful. If it's not, okay. Then how do I deal with this so it's it's not it it's not impeding on my life in a negative way? And I guess that goes back to the dinners because you just never know what's going to happen at whatever whatever know. dinner it is. With, you just never know the weddings, the the events, the just regular everyday week week weekly dinners that some families have. We have to be so in alignment with who we are and be comfortable with that person in order to embody uh, what's around us, you know? Exactly, Mm -hmm. exactly. Once we're confident and we, and we just don't care what people say or think, you know, then then we let things just slide off and it makes life so much easier. (laughs) Oh, so much easier. So with that being said, you, you also have, uh, you have another, another um, project that you work on that I love that's actually come out of the the pandemic and, and working with uh, friends that are in various areas of healing and, and 
that would be the carpool coaching. <laughs> I want to talk about that because it's so fun. I mean, we there there's a there's a traumatic situation happening right now that could affect people going forward. The young parents, right. the ones that are staying home and whole, homeschooling, and how do I deal with this and how do I deal with that? And how are the kids handling being home and not being socially interacting with other people? So you've created something positive out of something that is negative right now. And elaborate on the carpool coaching. So fun. So first, let me, my my co-host is Jackie Atchison. She's a divorce coach and marriage mediator. And she's like, we happened to, we found out that we live like nearby. So it was just, we became really good friends. We were both originally in a group called uh, Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. We were the experts on that team. And we got opportunities to be on like the iHeart Radio show. And, and we did some uh, you know, monthly writings, articles for an online magazine. And so we we really clicked right away because she's also a door of Holocaust survivors. And like, it's mm-hmm. just like, you know, it, it, your sisters, when you know, when, you're, when you share a trauma, you become like sisters and you get each other. You don't have to explain it. So for us, that was great. And uh, we both did an uh, online um, Facebook group called, uh, you know, Facebook Live Challenge, 21 Day Challenge. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. And from that point on, we started doing this, we started doing Facebook Live as a, as a, as the two of us in a car. And we ended up starting calling, it was originally Thursday 4th at 3, because it's always on Thursday, Thursdays at 3. And then it became couple coaching because people love the idea that we were coaching from the car. And it's about 10 minutes. And it started off with like lots of issues that goes on in our lives. And we we're pretty, you know, up to date of what we talk about. You know, we, we, we do n- never go political. That was one thing we chose never to go because it's such a, you know, po- so polarizing. But we decided like every, every issue that every, woman has in their life, whether it's, you know, whether it's the trauma, whether it's the children, whether it's the spouse, whether it's, you know, you know, what's going on in the world around them at the time. So the past few months, you know, we've been doing, um, we've been talking a lot about the COVID, you know, of course, we were in our own homes, you know, we, we joked around, we put like, you know, the background, the virtual background was about the back of the car, kind of like we were still in the car. And we just, you know, but you know what, we, you know, what every issue in life there is always you know we, we can look at it in two ways you know, we again we have a choice we have the choice to have a perspective of like looking at things negatively or look at things positively it's a choice of happiness you know we make those choices we were talking about that earlier about the ability how fortunate for us we have choices in life and we do have the power to choose so you know there are a lot of you know, heavy weighted stuff going on us. And one of the things that Jackie and I do is we, we're serious about it, but we also try to create a lightness about it by joking with each other because laughter is one of, of the proponents of healing. Mm-hmm. And it's so important to find humor in something tragic for us to you know, understand, like, to deal with it, it's a, it's a defense mechanism, you know, mm-hmm. it was like in the, like in the movie, uh, Life is Beautiful, if you recall, mm-hmm. um, you know, you know, in order to survive, it's such a survival mechanism, like, to find humor, because humor is a, it, you know, releases endorphins, right, you know, laughter mm-hmm. releases endorphins, and I think it's important to, you know, go through the process and, and take life seriously, but find humor in it. Because if you don't find humor in it, then you're always going to feel you're in quicksand and you'll never get out of whatever, whatever life throws our way. You know, yeah, totally. Jack, Jack, Jackie and I talk about, you know, there's that Yiddish expression, you know, you know man trok and God lust means man plans and God laughs. And mm-hmm. God to laugh, we got to do the same thing. You know, we, you know, that means like, you know, God has different plans. We can plan and plan. God can change a plan, you know, in a moment. And then how do you deal with that? So you got to just like laugh it off. Yeah, there's there's absolutely humor in healing. And you might not realize it when you're going through the upset. And I, I mean, I, I'm sure you have examples. I know I do where you're in the, when you feel like you're at the bottom of the bottom and how can you possibly laugh? It's the worst thing in the world. Da, 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 da. But when you get to a point where we we have to feel like 
Yeah. So many of us are avoiding feeling and it's not just thinking and processing, it's feeling. And once we feel and we, we get in touch with those feelings and, and then we think through it and do the work, we see, oh, you know what? I, I can see that, that that was pretty, that was, that kind of sucked. That was a little toxic, but yeah. man, <laughs> you know, and you do find the humor somewhere in there. And that's so important. And especially right. afterwards, creating creating this powerful space to just laugh at a situation. Um, because you're right, without laughter, where are we? You know, definitely. Right. Right. I mean, listen, you keep digging a deeper hole for us. Mm -hmm. Where laughter can bring us out or and the actions can bring us out. And the only way we take actions is we stop a moment, acknowledge, kind of like a meditation, you mm -hmm. acknowledge certain things and say thank you and from that what lesson have I learned is most important mm -hmm. of everything we go through what is the lesson why why did God send this to me again and again and like it'll happen over and over again until that lesson is learned and you've just got to find humor in it because mm -hmm. you know I mean you know we had I was just laughing the other day because we had like a little bit of a of a flood you know something happened and there's like a little bit of water my two sons and I were like busy trying to bail out this water and like one was slipped it was like it was like a three stooges episode and we were rushing and stressed out like cleaning it up cleaning it up and now you look back and like it, it was harried at the time and but we were it was just laughter you had to laugh I mean that's not a big trauma thing but it was like you're in a situation where like this wasn't meant to be and you just do it you right. just do it and find laughter out of it. It was like the three of us like slipping on the floor and, and laughing and chipping and bucking and passing the bucket of water. Yeah, it, it was just, you know, in those situations. You have to laugh. Well, that's the thing. There's, there's nothing you can do in that moment to change what's happening in that moment. Obviously, you can change it by processing and be like, okay, how do we get out of this moment? But in the moment, it's like, okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> somebody, somebody get a boat. <laughs> Exactly. You, know? exactly. you have to be able to laugh at the little things. We get worked right. up about little things sometimes. And th those are the little things where laughter can really, can really pave the way towards the healing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's an adventure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's an adventure. One thing I want to ask you in regards to the ancestral trauma and the work that you're doing there, being that your parents did pass when you were younger in your twenties and you were able to, to have those deep conversations, especially with your mom. If, if you, if they were still here today, do you think the conversation would be different from the work you've done in your healing and with art men's hearts coming out and everything you've done in the last so many years since they passed, how would it be different? How would that conversation be different? Well, first, I'd probably be more interested in learning about what they've gone through. Like, mm -hmm. I got an overall picture. You know, they used to talk to me about the war, and I, I was like, put my fingers in my ears. Like, I don't want to hear about it. You know? mm -hmm. And so for me, I wish I would have listened when I was younger. Um, I would have loved to have recorded their stories because Spielberg wasn't doing it at the time. So I would have loved to have been able to go back to their roots and understand what they've gone through. So I can understand it and I can, and I can like, um, probably let go because when I'm asked, I don't know. I don't know. I wish I knew. I wish I knew. You know, I don't know much mm -hmm. about my grand, my great grandparents, the grandparents, like those who did not survive. I don't know much about, you know, I wish I had more information. So I think that's the, one of the biggest things. But I think now as an, if, you know, as an adult woman and my parents are still around, uh, I think I would still have, show great respect for them because I, I was very respectful, but I would find that I would have the ability to not shut down whenever they would tell me something, you know, I would be, I wouldn't be afraid to say what I need to say when, because when I was little, I, I was afraid I was totally shut down, you know, like, don't think that way. Don't think like, don't be like that. Don't, don't act like that. Don't do that. You know, it was always like, tell me what not to do, you know, mm -hmm. but it was because it was more like, you know, stay down, hide, be small, but, you know, and then I'm thinking, like, now I realize, like, wait a minute, they were hiding in the forest, no wonder they had, you know, in, in Russia, no wonder they had to stay down, be low, and hide, you know, don't show anybody you're Jewish, don't let anybody know, and it's like, oh, it's about hiding who we were, and staying low, and I feel that didn't give me the opportunity to express myself and be heard, you know, 
Um, I think for me, my favorite thing to do as a child was dance and cheerleading because that was my own expression I was allowed to scream and I to express myself in that way which um I wasn't allowed to do elsewhere mm. so that's why the creative writing comes up and the cheerleading that's what we do you know expressing language outlet. and che- outlets and yeah. cheerleading is like rah 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 and that's who I became I became my client's cheerleaders too And it's interesting by bringing that up, you know, what your parents went through, there are so many who have had parents that have been uh, in combat, you know, being, I I lived the military life for a number of years and the the amount of trauma that exists there from a parent coming home from whatever they were seeing, you know, the Uh, veterans, yeah, the veterans and combat vets and um, not knowing and just, or not even a parent, even a spouse, not, right. not touching on certain topics because it was a triggering topic. And and then you're leaving that person with, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm tap dancing, I'm eggshelling around this. I, right. I, and exactly. you want to like you, you want to be empathetic and you, and sometimes we really want to know so we can support in the best way possible. So it's learning right. those tools as well. Of what, exactly. What's yeah, appropriate. I, I, yeah. Right. And also my husband's father was also a child. He, my husband's a child survivor too. My father-in-law was in, in Auschwitz and oh. uh, he never spoke a word. You know, he didn't. So, so yeah, they walked around eggshells around him too until he was ready to open up. And then that happened when my, when my eldest daughter was a, a senior in high school. Um, they, she went to Jewish day school and they took them on a trip to Poland and I think that's when I turned to my father-in-law. And I asked him about his experience during right. the war because I wanted my daughter to know what to, you know, when she goes to Auschwitz, like understand, like this is where your grandfather was, you know, too. So I, I think it's important, you know, it's very hard for a lot of um, the survivors to have told their stories. Thank God there are so many stories that were told yeah. because we need to keep their stories alive with all the, you know, a lot of. Um, people are Holocaust deniers. So we need to keep their stories alive. But there's also people who are just telling their stories just in everyday life, going about their life and living. And there's so much out there now where everyday people are just, they are opening up and, and they're giving us the gift of their story so that we have a better understanding. You know, the documentaries, the Netflix, all of that right. is creating that space. And goodness, right. I just, just the children need to know this exists, you know? Right. And, and, you know, there, there was a book I had read years ago, um, called, um, you know, it was, it, work does not set you free opposed mm-hmm. to, you know, the, the sign in front of, uh, in front of Auschwitz that says work will make you free that people, you know, when the Jews are brought to the Auschwitz, that's the first thing they see. And it's okay, we have to work hard so we can be free, you know. Mm-hmm. But of course, you know, it does not make you free. It was the name of this book and it was short stories of like children survivors, you know, telling stories like, you know, my mom put me to bed and all she would read is like, tell me, you know, she was telling me stories that her hiding in the forest or the parents or whatever it was mm-hmm. and the Nazis and scared and the only one I wanted her to read to me was like, you know, Goldilocks and Three Bears. Like, why yeah. can't she be like a normal parent and read the normal bedtime stories? So, you know, and I actually tried to get a book together, an anthology together of children of Holocaust survivors who's been in, you know, as an inspiration of those who were able to deal with it. I mean, I had, I do online workshops as well. Uh, in terms of an online workshop, and one, one of the child of Holocaust survivors. He, it was a gentleman, and he was sitting there in a dark, dark room with the, with the curtains shut. And I would say, I, I can't see you. You have to give me some light. I can see you. And after a while, he, he lifts up the curtains, you know, behind him. And I said, it, tur- it was because he was so paranoid that maybe, you know, people were, the Nazis were coming and peeking into his window. And this is, this is like a people who are about like 10 to 15 years older than I am. I am like one of the younger people of second generation. So mm-hmm. people in their seventies who are children of survivors, you know, and they, they're having the hardest time the closer you were to being born like post, you know, Holocaust, mm-hmm. perhaps being born in DP camps, and displaced persons camps. They're the one has most trauma, you know, because their parents didn't have time to process the information. They just want to have kids and, and grow and, 
you know, there's that there's that uh, idea of Hitler's revenge, and we'll get back, we'll bring back six million Jews. You know, so it was about them procreating, bringing, you know, and and making a better life for their family and their children. But um, yeah, so they still like a lot of the older children survivors are still having a hard time because they parents never processed. At least my my mom was born during the war, so I had this mm. one time separate from mm. wartime. Yeah, and it made it easier for me. Well, it, it also goes it goes back to thinking about what we're going through right now. There's so much turmoil in the world. There's there's a lot of upset and and hate, and we're seeing a lot of persecution. And not that I want to get political, but you know how do we how do we deal with things like that? Because there are groups of people that are being persecuted, and some more so than others. But we have a responsibility. Um, especially, I mean, parents, but ourselves, it comes from ourselves first. What we're putting out there is what we're putting out there in the world, you know? So right. it's more than just well, reading night or a man's search for meaning or the diary of Anne Frank, you know? Right. Right. Well, first of all, you know, there's this term we use in, in Hebrew called tikkun olam. And the idea behind it is to create peace in the world. Mm-hmm. And it starts with us. It starts with one person at a time. So that's why I work with the relationship with yourself and then eventually relationships with others and hopefully it will become more, have a more global impact in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the most important thing we need to do is first understand us and forgive our parents and understand that what we were taught and our, the beliefs and the traditions that we were taught can be challenged, mm-hmm. right? If you, if, 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 if you happen to be, you know, a homosexual and you grew up in a Catholic home, you know, that does not, or even a Jewish home, Orthodox Jewish home, let's just say, and even these very religious homes, they don't abide by homosexuality. And so a lot of people hide and they keep their sexuality private because it's not, you're not allowed to be that according to God, right? Mm-hmm. according to what, you know, orthodox, you know, people believe. When we're able to start challenging these beliefs and become our authentic self, that's where it begins. Finding who you are, empowering ourselves with our authentic being and not being afraid to challenge um, ourselves. So, Here's a silly instance, you know, I, of course, I grew up as a child survivor. A lot of people I know, my peers or children survivors, they will not buy a German car. Why? Mm-hmm. Because it was made in Germany and Hitler, you know, was ruled by, in Hitler ruled Germany and so forth. It's just a mindset. It's not these, the people who are making their Mercedes or BMW today are not the same people who were part you know, behind Hitler and the war. They're different people. And I think that's what we need to realize, that just because, um, you know, we have this idea of, you know, the stereo, the typical stereotypes that were passed on from generation to generation doesn't mean that it's true. Mm-hmm. It was just something that was passed through. It's a belief. Now, we need to learn to challenge our belief. I work with this woman. Her name is Christina Heike. She is also a healer in ancestral trauma. She is a she's a German woman, and she is a daughter of, of German World War II survivors. And we had a conversation. And when I told her, you know, she she appreciated me telling that I was war survivors. And when I asked her where she from, she was reluctant to tell me that she was German because she felt shame and guilt. Mm. So, so you know. We all think we're the victims, but if we start understanding that other people are victims too, and and it's not only about us, it's about empathy for others, and then we can start a dialogue. Then we can have the conversation. So she and I realized we have similar traumas, even though we are on either side of the war. You know, our ancestors are from either side of the war. So we actually started dialogue, and we do talks now, and we're going out there and having conversations about opening up our, uh, who we are and the trauma and how similar we are, but the belief system that we were told about the other person, because she was afraid to tell me because she was afraid maybe I would be angry with her, you know? 
Um, and, and the same thing with, you know, with everything going on now with the, you know, the African Americans who are finally like being heard. And I have to give that a lot to the people who are on social media sharing their stories because, you know, when we grew up, not, not every high school taught us everything about African Americans, about, you know, Jewish Americans, about Asian Americans, or, you know, even the American Indians, you know, we, you know, history book tells us one story. We don't know the other side. And I think that's why we need to be willing to hear the other side and have empathy. So have a dialogue. If you don't, instead of being afraid, you know, face them. I had a wonderful dialogue. I did a podcast with with um, three African American women. One of them was also a, a healer, and I've learned so much because I wanted to learn. I needed to understand mm-hmm. them and share with them. You know what? We have like in different ways, similar backgrounds. You know. You have the slavery component, you have the ghetto component, you have the being treated a human component. So I empathize with them and they and they're learning to empathize with me. And I think that's what it comes down to. We we all have our trauma. It's definitely up to each of us to educate ourselves. Uh, we, we can't put that responsibility on others to educate us. We need to be active listeners. We need to process it. And we need to make decisions that are for the betterment of all. And uh, the the fact that there's, there is a lot of upset and and anger that we're not listening or not we, but that people aren't listening and not hearing the story. And there's this feeling of, I need to speak out. I just want to hold space for people to do that, you know, and that's where the learning comes from sitting back and being like, okay, um, where, what can I do to be a part of the, the better solution for all? What can I do to make this a better place for all of us? Teach, teach me by share, share with me and let me, let me understand, give me the tools so that I can make better choices rather than being uh being spoken to share with me it's really how we're having the conversations that can be very empowering and like you i've I've been in that position where i've spent a lot of time the last couple months especially uh, you know really listening to people of color really listening to to the stories that are being told the upsets doing what i can to be a better person for myself first, you know, and then for those around me, my clients even, and just friends, family, whoever, because everyone has a story and every story is valid, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and let's let's bring that back to Uncle Joe, you know? Right. There's a reason why Uncle Joe behaves in a certain way. Mm -hmm. The behavior is manifested by thoughts and beliefs that he grew up with. So maybe instead of getting angry, ask Uncle Joe, tell me about your childhood or tell me something that is interesting about you instead of getting angry. So you can understand why he acts a certain way, you know, have that dialogue, have that dialogue with people you don't understand. It's interesting you bring that up because I was going to bring that up before and I got sidetracked just listening to you because it was very interesting (laughs) Um, about the older generation uh, briefly that it almost is like going back to childhood. There is a generation that is not being heard. Uh, we, especially as they get older, uh, we're dealing with the geriatric palliative care. Uh, and I have people I've been working with who are older and, and I realize that, oh goodness, they just want to be heard. They want to tell their stories. And a lot of times, especially when they're put in a home where they're, they're robbed of their independence or they're just getting older and dealing with loss of memory or whatever it is, holding space for them, especially to be able to share. Sometimes the long-term memory is much better than the short term. And it really is quite beautiful to sit there and let them share because it's almost like listening to a child, give them the space to share. Yeah. You might find a really beautiful common interest or story that you never even knew existed about that person 
just because they're old or they're frail or they're short tempered or they steal knives from the restaurant or, <laughs> or they get angry about the wrong things or they fall asleep at four o'clock in the afternoon, whatever it is, give them the space to share because you might be really pleasantly surprised with what you hear. And you know what? There's so much wisdom behind them. They, they've lived life. They've lived experience. So there's so much wisdom you yes. can learn from them. I mean, I remember reading Tuesdays with Maury. I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. reading I that. Remember the book, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, this guy, Mitch Alba, who wrote the book, and, and he just, every Tuesday, met it with Maury. And he just learned so much from his wisdom and mm-hmm. life experience and knowledge. So, yeah, you know, you know, the older people are so much wiser and they and, and giving them a sense of purpose making them feel wanted they can feel needed making them feel heard is so important for their longevity and good health as well yeah and it could create a really beautiful space for the two of you you know whoever yeah. that person is to have a different kind yeah. of relationship going forward and realize right. that you might have more in common than you think you know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> those whom you butt head, those whom you butt heads with, there's a reason for it because yeah. maybe they they have something about them is re, is in you that you have not dealt with. You know, mm-hmm. I've done that too. You know, learn about like what is it about them I don't like that I is actually a reflection of something in me I don't like. You know, back to the mirror and <laughs> go back to the mirror in your shadow work. <laughs> So, yeah, but yeah, go, you know, be nice to Uncle Joe and, you know, and resolve issues with mom, dad, you know, before mm-hmm. it's too late, um, you know, because like I said, you'll be left on the earth plane. I had a client just the other day. She has issues with her mother and like she can't deal with her mother. Her, she, you know, she has dementia and she's accusing her of doing all these wrongdoings, mm-hmm. but she lives in Florida and she says, you know, she, you know, I got the doctor that she's doing well. She's not doing well. She's really getting bad. And like, poor, and like, she. I said, you know what? And she says, and she started making excuses like, I go, but I take my kids to college. I said, no, you're making excuses. Your kids can manage on their own. Mm. But if this is your, if this is the last time for your, you to see your mother or something, go resolve your issues with her. Otherwise, if she leaves, you're going to be so regretful. She mm. actually decided to get on a plane. She went to Florida and she came back. And she said, Susan, I have to tell you. She was not the woman she's been the past few years. She's been the woman from my childhood, and she said the things I needed to hear. And that's my last. I, I just need to leave then that moment on a good note. I said, "Good for you." Yeah. You know, I'm a. I, my brother and I remind ourselves of that a lot when we get a little irritated with our mom and little things because children do right. And we always have this little saying that you know, if we get worked up, we're like, "Oh, you know, mom said this," or "I, I can't believe I dealt with that," or. Blah blah blah. We'll just go LRP, LRP, and it means last remaining parent. And it's a reminder uh-huh. for ourselves mm-hmm. to just stop and sit and be like, she's the one we have to nurture and take care of because she's what we have left on this planet. Yeah. And um, yeah. every conversation could be the last conversation. So treat her exactly. with, like a queen. You know, even if there's upsets there, realize that she had stuff she went through, and that goes for everyone. Like, just remember right. that they have a story of their own. They have a story of their own, and unlike us, they didn't have the opportunity to, you know, go to therapy, read mm-hmm. psychology today, get all the answers they need. Like they are, don't forget, they're in the fifties and sixties where everything was hush mm-hmm. hush. Mm-hmm. Everything was about, you know, you know, bring your neighbor the sugar, but you know, don't tell them anything negative that goes on in your home. So it wasn't sure. We were all so much more open, you know, especially yeah. now and with, you know, with all the social media, everybody's too open in my opinion, but it's still open out there. So there's nothing to hide anymore. If, if so. you were wrapping things up now, if you were to give a one piece of advice to people out there listening who might be dealing with ancestral trauma or just their own upsets and family upsets or whatever it is, what would you say to them? Uh, I think learn to love yourself first, you know, learn to understand and learn to understand what your parents had gone through. What were their, what were their belief systems? What was their, you know, survival tactics? Understand it. And you don't have to agree with it. But you also have to understand that they were survivors and therefore they did teach you survival skills. So I think you should thank them for that too. 
Yeah. Survivors of something. Yeah. You learned a lot of survival skills. Um, and, and I think that if, no matter what your issues with your parents, learn the lesson they taught you mm-hmm. and take that with you to make yourself a better person. Beautiful. On that note, I want to do a rapid fire with you real quick. <laughs> Are you ready? Put I'm your hands ready. together and create some energy. <laughs> okay. I'm so doing, honey. Like, I'm putting yeah. it right next to my heart. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Take some take those three deep breaths. Here they come. They're just one word I'll throw at you and then you just throw a word back, okay? Mm-hmm. All right. Ancestry. Trauma. Empowerment. Self love. Art. Men's heart. Good. I like that you're like, you know, the, the <laughs> little promo there. Um, choices. <laughs> the power of choice. The power. 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 Good. Motherhood. Nurture. Mm. Hearts. Love. Yeah. Ooh, I kind of guessed a couple that you were going to say on that. I love it. We're such in alignment. That's super. <laughs> Susan, what a pleasure. You you are a delight to talk to. Thank you for sharing your gift and who you are. And, um, you know, j- thank you for holding space for so many people in healing. Uh, we all have such amazing gifts to offer in our own unique way and creating that space through art, through just being heard and you know, making the story powerful and valid. I I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to come here and share my experience and knowledge with you. I really enjoy having this conversation with you, Hillary. Like you said, we are in alignment. We get each other so much in alignment that we just recently found out we live near each other, which is a blessing in itself. If you want more information on Susan, visit my Holistically Speaking podcast page for details at hillaryrusso.com. And if you're enjoying this podcast, consider subscribing. You can also rate and review the show, which is available on all podcast platforms. Your continued support helps me bring empowering conversations directly to you. Holistically Speaking is produced by Alan Seals with music by Lipbone Redding. And if you have a great topic you'd like to hear and for me to share, let me know. Drop me a line on my website or on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can find me on all three at Hillary Russo. And consider joining my Thrive Hive to get all the buzz on what it takes to live mindfully. Connection is everything, and it's why I'm here. So thank you for welcoming me into your space. Until next time, be safe, be well. And don't forget to laugh.